Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. I'm your host. Appreciate you taking some time to tune in and watch my show. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the EV news, things going on in the EV world, and just some stories you may or may not be following. So let's get right into it today. My first story for today's show is to talk about the EV sales ramp up that's going on here locally in Canada. So I'm wearing my Canadian shirt today. Um, in the second quarter of 2018, we have seen sales skyrocket here in Canada. In fact, they're 214% year over year growth in EV sales. And our province here where I live in Ontario has led that sales growth with over 143% for year over year, just in Ontario alone. That gives a total amount of EV sold of almost 15,000 so far this year. And that market share has climbed to 2.3%, which is up from 0.7% of last year. Now these sales obviously were driven by, or some of them at least, by the Tesla Model 3 release in the May timeframe when we started getting deliveries in late May and June. Uh, but we have to remember that right now in Ontario, uh, in fact, in Canada as a whole, there are 37 different models of EVs that are available. Now, this does include plug-in and hybrid electric uh, vehicles as well. But we have, there's a lot of choice for consumers, and that's a good thing here in Canada. The total sales have reached over 70,000 plug-in vehicles in Canada, and about half of those are split um, between battery electric or all-electric only vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So as I've been talking about for many months, we're seeing that shift in EV adoption go from a plug-in hybrid now as technology and I think consumer confidence becomes more of a reality. We're seeing a lot of more people take the plunge and jump into full battery electric or all electric only vehicles. And that's great. So what were the top five battery electric vehicles here in Canada so far this year? Well, it's no doubt that the Tesla Model 3 has top ranks. Uh, sales went crazy when they started to uh, deliver them in May, June, and July, and they continued to deliver t uh, Tesla Model 3s. Nissan Leaf has done very well here in Canada, and it takes our second spot, followed by the Chevy Bolt, the Kia Soul EV, which is doing very well in Canada. Um, it's not seen in a lot of other countries. In fact, in Europe, it does well. And rounding out the top five is the Hyundai Ioniq. Now, some of these are probably, the, some of the ranking is attributed to potentially delivery issues with some of these vehicles, where there are longer wait times now for the Bolt and the Ionic as an example, and even the Leaf is experiencing that. So what's the reason for the fast growth? Well, I think we all can kind of figure out what that is, but in case you can't, it's really increased car buyer comfort and you know more interest in the technology as we see more and more uh, news about EVs in various websites and, and, and social media and everywhere. So the word's getting out farther, uh, of course, with governments and, and other associations and clubs and everything. Just, just a lot of action out there. People like myself doing YouTube shows and a lot of content about electric vehicles that are making the airwaves. Of course, there's new EV models that continue to be announced and released. And then they, these EV models, as I mentioned, they cover many consumer needs and markets. So the choice is becoming much easier and much more prominent for people that are looking to adopt an EV in their life. Now they have a lot more to choose from to try to fit their lifestyles. And as I mentioned earlier, the release of the Model 3 certainly contributed to the fast growth uh, that we saw here in Canada and that we continue to see. Now, hopefully with the Ontario incentives going away after our change of government mid-year, uh, we do anticipate to see a slowdown here in Ontario for EV growth, but I think it's going to be just a minor slowdown. The rest of, of the provinces will continue to grow, and I, I believe um, there may be, you know, some dealers might do some small incentives, but I think people are starting to figure out that there's infrastructure and there's cost of ownership and cost of operating electric vehicles um, that, along with many other reasons, can make them a very viable choice. So we can continue to monitor the numbers, and uh, but that's good news for Canada. Now, in the past, I've talked about big oil companies and what they're doing in the EV marketplace. Shell is one that's come up in conversation before, and there's a recent article that I came across about Shell Oil leading an investment into an EV-focused startup company. Um, there's 31 millions of Series A round financing in a company called Ample, and Ample's uh, goal is really to make electric cars for everyone. 
with a focus on developing technology to solving the energy delivery challenges for electric cars. Now, apparently they have invested in, um, or they have invented an economical and rapidly deployable and widely accessible platform, technology platform, that can deliver a full charge to any electric vehicle in minutes. Hmm, sounds pretty promising. Now, Ample uses autonomous robots and smart battery technologies with battery swap capabilities. So now I think we're peeling away at the onion and getting a little bit more information. Now, they're still in stealth mode, so I can't, I could not find many more facts beyond what I've stated already today. Um, but they do provide comments about combining Apple Ample's technology with Shell's existing retail network. And that's uh, poten potentially the reason that Shell is making an investment in this EV startup. They could certainly see um, having a, an EV charger set up of some fort in every or in many, many Shell existing retail locations. They've already got the footprint, they've got the real estate, they're out there with their gas stations. Certainly would make sense for them to start adding EVs and charging to the mix, EV support and charging to the mix. So Shell seems to be leading this push as they have the involvement already, of course, in the new Ionity charging network in Europe. They have some money and they've been part of that whole rollout by providing funding there. Also, they do continue to build their own chargers from, for many gas stations. I think this is predominantly in Europe, but also I believe here in North America. And they recently require, acquired a charging network that has over 30,000 chargers. So when you talk when you uh, talk to people about EV infrastructure and they are concerned about the lack of it, let them know that uh, big oil giants like Shell, as an example, are spending billions and billions, or at least hundreds of millions of dollars, in investments into the EV charging infrastructure. So great to see Shell get into the game and recognize this, and I believe they're one of the earlier adopters in going after this marketplace. So we'll have to continue to watch and. Uh, it's all good for us because it'll just mean more charging stations and, and a larger infrastructure to choose from. Now, while on the topic of charging, uh, there's new technology that's come out and it's something called the tritium, if I got that right, or tritium. Um, and these are ultra fast chargers and they'll supply up to 475 kilowatt of charging power. A Sri Lankan company that unveiled their new uh, they call it the VFIL PK, if I got that right, model of charger. And these are uh, enterprise grade. Uh, they're scalable for public infrastructures and for commercial operators. So this is not something that you would buy and stick in your garage unless you've got a boatload of money and, and uh, ways to do that. Now, these chargers are rated for uh, 175 up to 475 kilowatts. Um, so great. Uh, just again, to see more technology coming out there. Chargers are that technology is advancing rapidly. Um, we will we will need to see the cars and the the sustain the uh, vehicles and the capabilities that they have uh, also match that rate of, of growth. And a lot of auto manufacturers are getting into that game with that by announcing models that will support higher, faster charging rates. So uh, good on this company if you have a chance to check them out. And if you're in Australia, I'd love to see a photo or send me an email um, of once you see any of these uh, installed. Uh, I'd like, love to hear more about it from your perspective. Now on to some manufacturer news. VW, we've talked about that them quite a lot. And a recent article, an announcement has come out that there's could be a possible recall for uh, many of the VW EV brands and models that they carry. Uh, in fact, it may uh, amount up to recalling 124,000 or so electric and hybrid cards from the VW Group brands. Now, that includes VW, Audi, and Porsche, due uh, to a poisonous um, cadmium finding its way into the charger components, into parts of those assemblies. Now, the recall is right now it's in the works. It's in a clarification mode by the KBA and it's, it's old German. So I wasn't going to try to pronounce that, but it's really the jo German Road Authority. And um, cadmium is a heavy metal and has been found in all electric and plug in hybrid vehicles from VW uh, starting in 2013 and up until last month. So being July of this year. Now, VW did briefly halt production in order to use a new part to, to substitute this part. And the part in question contains just 0.008 grams of cadmium per device. 
Now, VW is stating that the recall is not necessary since the part um, is really installed in a solid housing inside the charger, which again is enclosed by another solid housing. So they don't really see that anybody's going to get access to this part uh, in question that contains um, this very small amount of cadmium. Uh, however, um, I think the bigger picture is, and the KB, that's one of the reasons the KBA is looking into this, is some of the environmental impacts about where this material could end up at the end of life of the vehicles. So more discussions and um, uh, more, more uh, analysis is going on right now of this. Um, I did reach out to VW Canada to see if they would comment on this potential recall, and I did not get a response. So hopefully um, they may send me something soon and I can provide you an update. So uh, keep your eyes out for this and uh, we'll see what happens. Touching upon Hyundai for a sec, um, boy, they keep making the news every week. There's lots of articles coming out. Um, good news, those finally those Konas that we've been talking about for quite a long time. Well, they are delivering them, and they've delivered the first batch to Norway. Of course, no surprise there. And in fact, they've garnered over 20,000 reservations for the Kona already. And it's only been a couple of months, I guess, since really the activity has been buzzing for those guys. Um, they just did initial deliveries of over 100 vehicles uh, in July, so as they started out. Um, it really is an exciting vehicle. However, the drawback, I think, is that Hyundai is only going to produce, for what they've stated, about 30,000 units per year globally. And with this kind of early demand that we're seeing for the Kona, um, I get a lot of comments on the YouTube sites and a few emails by people that are really excited about the Kona and that are looking to that vehicle as their first entry into the all-electric uh, EV marketplace. Um, and I think that 30000 it really isn't going to cut it for Hyundai. So I really um, hope that they, uh, if anybody's listening, please take a hard look at your potential numbers that you want to produce for these cars globally because I, I think they're going to sell very well. Um, considering that they are offered in two battery pack trims or size levels, so they can they can cover a much broader market uh, share from a pricing and from a feature perspective. I think this car is going to this small SUV is going to do very well, or CUV as it's called, more like a crossover. Um, so good luck for them. But yeah, I hope they really step up production. So we'll uh, we'll follow the story and see what happens. I believe I mentioned late last year or early this year about BMW and their efforts into the new into producing new EV models. And one of that uh, that discussion was about the 3 Series becoming all electric. Well, there have been some spy shots recently snapped of, a, of the all electric um, 3 Series BMW prototype that's doing some track testing. I believe this is in Europe, I'm not 100% sure. Um, it's interesting that they, hit what they uh, saw it testing alongside a Model 3. So yes, it was Europe now that I remember the article. Um, so obviously it seems BMW is, is targeting Tesla. Well, that's no surprise because Tesla has been targeting BMW since day one. Uh, we know that the Model 3 is a midsize, a luxury, all-electric battery vehicle uh, targeting BMW, Audi A4, and the C-Class Mercedes, just to name a few. It's in that marketplace at a price point as well. So no surprise to see BMW doing some testing and, and looking at the Model 3 performance metric and seeing how their 3 Series will stack up. Uh, the initial view is, I think, from a, from maybe a positive perspective, is that the um, all-electric 3 Series car looks just like a, a normal 3 Series BMW car. However, there should be some you know su subtle styling cues and differences to promote that it's an all-electric power uh, vehicle. I have no other technical specs yet that I could find. However, if the Model 3 is competition, which it looks like it is, then I would I would guess that the all-electric 3 Series should have similar numbers, both range, in range, acceleration, handling, turning circle, all that kind of stuff, space, uh, that similar to the Model 3. Um, we are hoping that there's going to be an announcement of the 3 Series all-electric car in October at the Paris Auto Show. So stay tuned, and uh, I'll definitely report something as soon as I hear on that. Now, speaking of Tesla and testing, um, there's been more testing going on from the U.S. Insurance for Highway Safety, or the IIHS, um, and they are doing more safety testing, and they've released some info about the Model 3, uh, its Level 2 Autonomy Assist performance testing, and uh, there's lots of videos that are going out. I think the LEAF has the end cap stuff. There is some, I, I haven't seen full crash test data yet on the Model 3, only some, some side stuff that we saw way earlier back in the delivery last year. Uh, but these focused tests from the IHS recently were 
dedicated to lane keeping and automatic emergency braking. Now, auto steer is what Tesla calls their lane keeping technology, and it performed very well in the tests. However, curves and hills can be a challenge. And let me add that any level two lane keeping technology will have challenges in, her, in curves and hills as well. Uh, just, that's just the nature of the technology and trying to keep that car in the lane versus the environment. Now, the Model 3 did perform better than the others tested. They used an E-Class Mercedes and also a Volvo S90 in comparison with their technologies. Now, with um, automatic cruise control, or ACC, uh, Tesla calls it actually Traffic Aware Cruise Control, or TAC, T-A-C-C. Now, with that system off and auto brake on, um, cars did not completely stop but slowed down to mitigate crash um, with a stationary target. And when they turned attack back on uh, the traffic aware cruise control, um, the Model 3s tended to brake earlier and gentler with AEB and avoided the target completely. However, um, they did find that some unnecessary and overly cautious braking occurred at times in the Teslas. And I've noticed that there's a video out there if you search um, on, I believe it's a Model S from about two years ago, this S that's driving fully autonomous around um, should be easy to find. And the, the reason I bring that up is because there's a portion in that video where the Model S actually stops for two people that are walking along the side of the road. It's a, it's a two-lane road, and there's a couple people walking along the right shoulder of that two-lane road, and the, the Model S actually ends up stopping behind them and then, can, and then goes again. This was a test from a fully autonomous perspective, and the video is interesting because the, the Model S drove itself for, I don't know, 15 minutes or half an hour all by itself. So it navigated stop signs, traffic lights, all this kind of stuff. Um, it was really, really sophisticated as Tesla's continuing to test their, their fully autonomous systems. But the, the significance to that test was that it did stop for the two people along the road. And, and there are sometimes still some hiccups with these systems, maybe, you know, like a tree, a shadow of a tree that crosses the road or, or a signpost, maybe too close to the road or something like that. Sometimes that the systems can, can think it's something else than what it really is. And in this case, um, IAHS did notice that the braking in some cases was overly cautious and occurred earlier at times. And it could be because of something like that as they still work out the technology. Um, so anyway, good for them. Uh, good to see Tesla Model 3 doing well. It's unfortunate that they didn't really kind of lump it into maybe Nissan's Pro Pilot and some of the other systems that, uh, you know, Nissan's not in that luxury car space, but the technology, as I've talked about in video myself and, and used, uh, works really well. Uh, but good to see that uh, uh, testing is continuing to go on, and we know that Tesla will always look to update and improve uh, their features of their vehicles. Wanted to switch gears and talk about this recently startup company. Um, I'm not sure if I brought it up in a previous show or not. I believe I did, but the, they're starting to gain some traction. I've been actually communicating with these folks for quite some time and was hoping to go to Europe this year to actually do a review of the vehicle, but the timing and circumstances just haven't panned out. But it's a company called Sonos Motors. And it's, it's a German company, and they announced last year that they were going to come to a global market, not just Germany, but they wanted to reach a global market with an all-electric car, and they call it the Scion. And uh, the uniqueness about the Scion, if you see some video and pictures behind me, you know, it's a smaller urban type of compact car, certainly um, uh, great for, for, for everyday getting around. But the significance is that the entire vehicle is covered with solar panels. It's got about 330 cells on this car. Now, on a good sunny day, this can add about 30 kilometers or 18.64 miles for those who need it converted uh, of range on a, again, on a good bright day. Um, these models will have a battery pack size to travel about 250 kilometers or 155 mile range. Uh, they'll seat five, and another uniqueness to them is that uh, they'll be the only other EV manufacturer that I'm aware of, next to Nissan, that will provide bi-directional charging. So not only being able to charge your vehicle, but then that V to grid, vehicle to grid, vehicle to home type of terminology that you've heard before, the technology, be able to uh, put power back into the into something uh, through bi-directional means. Pricing was has been announced. It's starting at about sixteen thousand euros, which uh, in today's exchange rate is around eighteen thousand or so U.S. dollars, 
and they have already current pre-orders over 6,500. So that's great because they really only started showing the car um, earlier this year and doing some road testing. They did a series of events where they went out uh, to show the car publicly, to do some announcements in various cities across uh, a few of the European countries. And that's great that they've been able to garner uh, that kind of pre-order status. So good luck on them. Um, hopefully we will hear more about their expansion plans as they ramp up and, and that actually when they're going to start making deliveries. I don't have any timelines yet on ETA for deliveries, but I would guess that's going to be early 2019 at this point um, as they continue to work out the final uh, uh, production versions of the car and then uh, go and build them. So good luck for Sonos Motors. Nice to see something different there. Now sticking with unique cars, came across this story and I just had to put this up. You know, it's like when you see that puppy on YouTube or your or that cat and it's just so cute. Well, I saw this car called the Microlino or from this company, Micro, actually it's called the Microlino and it's inspired by the iconic uh, Isetta car, if you're familiar with that. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a new EV that's just come out over the last few months. Uh, obviously, because of the size and uh, access and uniqueness of the vehicle, it is targeted at more of an urban city mobility. It's a joint project with a manufacturer called Micro Mobility Systems and a uh, components provider called a Tazari, and they're based in Italy. Now, this is an all-electric car. It's initially going to be available just for the European markets with deliveries later this year, and they're quoting about just 100 units to start. So it's going to be very limited production. Uh, however, no surprise, they already have over 7,200 pre-orders for this car, and they want to ramp up to, to build a production rate of 5,000 units per year for next year, 2019. And uh, they're hoping that they can ramp up to that number and even actually produce even more, uh, up to 10,000 if the demand is there. Well, if they're only building 100 and there's 7,200 people want it right now, I would say it's a pretty good start for demand being there. So uh, let's hope that they, they do have those ramp up plans ready to enact if they need to. Uh, and they also want to go globally with this and they want to do it in a little bit different concept where they want to do it through a licensing program. So to allow local set for, for a local uh, assembly and distribution. Now what that means is that let's say somebody in Michigan wants to build these cars, they'll be able to build them locally under a licensing program with all the necessary things met. Uh, why is that good? Well, you don't have to worry about higher import duties and tariffs and things like that that we keep hearing in the news and that we know is going on to, to spike the, the auto price. But more importantly, that will add jobs to local markets. So I think that's a great concept from uh, for micromobility and Tazari to be able to, to leverage that. And of course, it keeps their capital amount lower because they don't have to you know, necessarily build plants themselves and get other people to do that. And, uh, and they still get you know, revenue stream from doing that. Uh, great idea. I think that, that, that this car is going to be picked up um, in a few places. I think we're definitely going to see it outside of Europe. Now, the range on this and the specs, uh, it's about 120 kilometer or 75 mile range on a standard 8 kilowatt hour battery um, or 215 kilometers or 134 miles for a 14.4 kilowatt hour battery. Top speed is about 90 kilometers an hour or that 55 double nickel miles per hour. It's got a 20 horsepower electric motor, but it does produce 110 newton meters or 81 foot pounds or pound feet sorry of torque and again we all know torque is what gets you going and in the city you're not going to go 55 in a lot of places where you're driving around in urban but this will do some quick you know quote unquote motorway highway jaunts at a relatively decent speed so congratulations on them pricing has announced to be from starting from 13,600 euros it's going to be a great alternative to Potentially, maybe the Smart 4 2 EVs or the Fiat uh, 500e that's out there that's kind of in that smaller class. Easy to park, easy to maneuver, great for you know just booting around, and again, zero emission, and that's what we're all about. So uh, good luck on them, and uh, I hope to see some soon. Now, finally, I wanted to do something a little bit completely different. Every once in a while, I stumble across something that's in the electric realm that's a little bit off the normal. And here's a, a Hungarian company called Narke, and uh, they're the first to bring to production. There are some prototypes out there, but this company's actually brought it to production, an all-electric jet ski. 
Now, this is a visually striking, uh, kind of reminds me of a stealth jet fighter type of thing with the angles and, and the lines in it. Uh, however, it's extremely quiet as, of course, we would think for anything that's electrified through its electrojet propulsion system. It's composed of lightweight composite materials, including carbon fiber. Uh, it's designed to efficiently cut through the water and, or glide uh, over it or on it at top speed. Uh, speeds can reach about 55 kilometers per hour or about 34 miles per hour via a water-cooled 45 kilowatt AC motor. Now, I don't jet ski. I'm not in that environment, but I do understand that jet skis uh, gas powered can go a lot faster than 34 miles an hour. I think some can get up to 55 or 60 miles an hour themselves. Um, you know, however, with the quiet, uh, the, the quiet factor of this jet ski and that it, it also has removable, swappable battery packs um, so that you could get a couple of battery packs, come to shore, swap it out and then go back out. That's basically your refueling, if you want to call that, um, just like you would for a camera or something else when you're changing batteries. Um, zero to 80 percent charging for these batteries is only about two hours and uh, that 80 percent will give you about an hour and a half of normal use that's pretty good time for being on a jet ski uh, make sure you wear your sunblock of course when you're out there safety first and of course a life vest um, now the first models are currently being tested on the lovely lake balaton which is south of budapest in hungary so you may if you if i have any hungarian viewers out there that are see, seeing these things i'd love you to take a picture or send it to me or just send me an email or a comment let me know what you think of these things if you're seeing them and no pricing or release date yet so uh, congratulations on them and uh, i hope this uh, again it's another industry where we can see electrification uh, adding a lot of advantages all right, I'm going to get into the mailbag this time. And I don't, um, don't necessarily have a lot of mail. i uh, got a few um, uh, emails from the last show, people just thanking me for doing the show and things like that. Um, I've been, and, of course, I do read the comments, and I try to respond to a lot of the comments. So just I'm, I'm going to, this is more of a comment mailbag than it is an email bag on this one. But it's basically a discussion that I clipped out that was part of um, you know, I had mentioned that a, a plug in, you know, a plug is a plug and any plug is a good thing at this point in time. Uh, kind of that statement a show or two ago. And, uh, you know, uh, this person had agreed with that, but they're saying, you know, they had told me that uh, the Tesla Model 3 is objectively su superior to all other EVs and haters are going to hate. And the discussion came about, you know, people kind of bashing other models. So I, I won't I won't do a long rant again because I think I've gone through this before. Um, but I, I just want to remind folks that we're all in here. Um, if you're watching this show, that you obviously has a cur you have a curiosity, or you have an interest, or you have a passion for electrification, electrified vehicles in general. So do I. That's why I do this show. And you know, any any car that has a plug at this point, whether it be a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, or an all-electric car, is definitely a choice that a lot of people can make to take that step to to look at the long-term goal of helping our planet. Right? That's really at the end result. We're doing this not because we want to drive fancy cars and we want to have instant torque and we want to lower our costs and all these, these benefits, but really we want to have lower emissions into our atmosphere to help affect climate change in a positive manner. That's, our, that's, our, that's, a, that's the big goal. Your personal motivation may vary. Obviously, people are going to get motivated for different reasons, and that's great because if the end result is still that goal, it all works. So... You know, when I talk about a Nissan Leaf or I talk about a, the Bolt, uh, Chevy Bolt, or I talk about the Ionic or whatever the models out there, then I get comments about, well, you know, the Model 3 is better than that, and the Model 3 does this, and Tesla is better, and, and all this stuff. And, and, you know, again, competition is good. It's healthy. We want to see competition. A Tesla Model 3 is not going to be the car for everybody. So it's a good car, yes, but let's get off the, the, the argument that Tesla is the best and everything else is not the best. We're all in this to promote EV adoption. So every model is going to have pros and cons. There's no doubt about that. One car isn't going to be for everybody. So uh, I'm very positive about all models that are out there. Um, and I will defend the pros and cons of all those models to the best of my ability. Because at the end of the day, I go out and talk to people and I try to get them interested in the reality that is electric vehicles and the state of electric vehicles today. And I think that's the messaging we should be taking to people. People go to Facebook and they go to forums and they read and all they read is people arguing about what's better and this is crap and all this kind of stuff. And 
If I was somebody coming in, looking at that, trying to investigate the EV world, I would immediately be turned off and said, you know what, there's, oh man, there's too much stuff going on there. I'm going to stick to my, uh, to my ICE vehicle for another five or 10 years, maybe, and not even worry about it. That's what turns people off, folks. So we need to get away from that argumentative mentality amongst ourselves in, in, in what we're trying to do is promote EV adoption. Please, folks, consider this when you're out talking to people. Um, our opinions do matter. Uh, people go to events, people watch YouTube, people read articles, people go to the websites and they read forums and they read things like that. Um, you know, th there's a lot of options for people. So any way to get them into into something that has a plug and at the end of the day, get them into something that just relies on electricity is the goal here. So hopefully that makes sense, folks. Um, you know, I, I always enjoy comments and I'm not trying to be confrontational or argumentative. I had a comment the other day saying that I was bullying somebody like, what? Come on. I'm the last guy in the world to bully anybody, folks. Uh, I'm just passionate about what I do and trying to get that message out. So I hope you guys are too. And I hope you continue to watch. And again, when you're talking to people and, and out there, be mindful of this. All right. We're all we're all doing following the same cause here. So thanks for the comments. And that really sparked some good um some good communications online. I just wanted to kind of bring that here to the show. Well, that's it for the show. Again, I'm trying to do these a bit shorter. So please email me. I'd love to hear from you. EVRevolutionShow at gmail.com is my email. Also follow me on Twitter and you can comment and send me stuff that way through at EVRevShow. If you haven't already subscribed to this YouTube channel, I would love it if you would. And don't forget to click on that little bell. That way, when I post a new show, you'll see it and you'll get automatically notified that something is there. As I mentioned a couple of shows ago, I started doing audio podcasts. And if you do follow me on YouTube, you would have seen these uh, go up just over the last few days. And I do apologize some of my Twitter followers for some of that, um, those announcements that went out. Uh, what I did is I just kind of cleaned up my, U my YouTube page, organized things, renamed some of the shows just to kind of make it look a little bit more consistent uh, from that perspective, a little more organized. And that just kept sending uh, these notifications to Twitter. So I, I, I think I found the way to stop doing that, uncheck the right button. So you shouldn't get that happening anymore. But I do apologize for that. Um, but those audio podcasts are now on YouTube as well. If you don't feel like going to either Google Play through for your Android device or through the iTunes podcast app and downloading that way and listening, you can certainly stream them through YouTube. I do plan on doing more of those audio podcasts. And uh, again, my thanks to those people that have initially provided funding and support through me for me through the Patreon campaign. If you're interested in looking into that and ways to support, you can check it out at www.patreon.com backslash EV Revolution Show. And I would appreciate uh, any support that you can get. Send me an email. Let me know what you think of the show, how I'm doing. If you if there's things that you'd like to see, subjects you'd like to talk about. I do plan on in the future bringing the odd occasional guest host and hosting for the show. And I do plan on doing more outside field stuff, reviews and things like that when things come up. Uh, as well. It won't always just be a studio-based stuff, but for now, um, this is what I had to report on since my last show, and I hope, hope you appreciated the news. And as always, thank you very much for tuning in and for watching and for supporting me. And until next time, take care and all the best. Mm -hmm.